Um, so uh, I'm going to introduce everyone. Maria, if you can go to the next slide. Oh, lost it. There we go. Uh, so our agenda today, we're going to go through some introductions, uh, and then we're going to. This is a project project progress update. So we'll do a quick recap of what the last meeting was, and then we'll go through what we've been working on since that last meeting, which is our constraints and feasibility analysis and our timeline, and then there'll be time for questions at the end. Uh, next slide, Marie. Um, so the team that is working on this, uh, I'm the project team leader for the city of Carpentria. My name is Erin Maker. I'm the environmental program manager. Uh, I work for the Public Works Department for the City of Carpentria, but this project is not just a Public Works project. It's a project that is for Public Works, our Parks Department, and um, Community Development has also had a lot of input in this. Erin is the principal planner with Wood, one of our consultant groups. Marie Lau, who will be giving a lot of the presentation, is uh, the a planner and grant program manager with Wood. Marie, did I mess up your last name? <laughs> it's Lolly. It's okay. Lolly. Nobody ever gets it right. I should have gone over that. Uh, Chris Webb is a coastal engineering project manager with Moffat and Nickel. Connor Austin is assistant project manager and coastal analyst with Moffat and Nickel. And then we have Dave Hubbard, dune designer and restoration ecologist with Coastal Restoration Consultants, and Matt James, who's also a dune designer and restoration ecologist with Coastal Restoration Consultants. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Marie Lolly. <laughs> Thank Marie, you. Go ahead. So it's not supposed to be on Zoom. Um, just a friendly reminder for everybody to please mute your mic if you can. And then um, at the end of the presentation, we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. So um, to kick us off, I will provide an overview of the goals and key drivers of this project um, as a refresher for some or as a first time listening for people who might have missed the first public workshop. First and foremost, our primary focus is planning for a living shoreline along the city beach with the added value of looking at cohesive shoreline management planning along Carpentria's entire shoreline. Creation of a living shoreline and restoration of a coastal dune system will address the need to protect vulnerable areas and resources against sea level rise. Vulnerable areas in the city include the downtown commercial corridor, the beach neighborhood and shorefront properties, as well as regional and local infrastructure, including roads, rail, parks, utility lines and storm drains. Additionally, Pursuing an integrated approach to achieving the important co-benefits that we have listed here, public health, recreation, the local economy, and natural ecosystems, as well as involving a variety of stakeholders in the planning process, will collectively contribute to the long-term benefits of this project. Another important component of this planning process is to identify potential funding sources and sediment sources for maintenance of the living shoreline, since those will be large obstacles for implementation. And even further, to recap on workshop number one, we went over sea level rise projections and vulnerabilities in Carpinteria, as identified in the city's sea level rise vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan. That study indicates that, um, again, the beach neighborhood, the downtown corridor, and the state park are all vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise. These low-lying areas are already threatened by coastal flooding. The biggest threat comes when storm surges are combined with high tides, which we've already seen happen out there. It's going to continue to intensify over time with sea level rise if sea level rise proceeds as projected, which is why we need to implement the living shoreline as a protective solution. In workshop number one, we covered existing shoreline protection techniques that occur up coast, down coast, and along the city beach frontage. Up coast is there's a revetment, down coast is the state park dune system, and along the city beach currently uh, the city pursues winter beach berms and occasionally emergency sediment disposal which happens by flood control. 
We also talked about current local and regional planning guidance documents for shoreline protection, including the city's ongoing general plan update. And lastly, we went over basic concepts for living shoreline and coastal dune processes that together will help inform design of the living shoreline along with the constraints and feasibility analysis. So the constraints and feasibility analysis is the highlight of our progress today, and that's what we're here to talk to you about today. The purpose of this ongoing task, task are to analyze opportunities and constraints of designing a living shoreline in Carpentria, to determine a set list of factors involved in implementation of the living shoreline, that's for construction and maintenance, and ultimately to develop a narrowed down list of alternative design options that will be carried forward to the next stages of the project. And with that, I'll hand it off to Connor to get into the nuts and the bolts of how the Constraints and Feasibility Report is shaping up. Awesome, thanks Marie. Hey everybody, my name is Connor Austin. I'm a coastal scientist with Moffat and Nickel. And Moffat and Nickel and CRC are working together on this constraints and feasibility report with Wood and the city. Now I'll go just go through uh, a little bit of an, uh, what is detailed inside that constraints and feasibility report, and we'll then uh, summarize and go to questions. And so please, if you have ideas about uh, topics that we bring up here, hold them for for questions, and we'll be we'll be really interested to hear your opinions and glad to answer your questions. For this project, we've broken down Carpinteria into four segments that are uh, sort of um, characterized by like um, shoreline types. Reach one is the Carpinteria Inlet to Ash Avenue, which is characterized are you by. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, uh, reach one is characterized by a revetment. A relatively narrow beach compared to a uh, city Am beach I area and the sandy land development behind. Reach two is Ash Avenue to Linden Avenue. This is the beach neighborhood, city beach. Um, it's a relatively wide sandy beach uh, compared to Reach one, and it's backed by uh, development, residential, hotel areas, businesses, which, which will uh, um, help define what the living shoreline might look like in that area. And then reach three is Linden Ave to Carpinteria Creek. This is this reach is occupied by California State Parks. The shoreline type is uh, relatively uh, habited by dunes, living short uh, vegetated sand dunes at the moment. So um, the, the project in this reach might look something more like enhancement than it would uh, construction of of a living shoreline. Just these shoreline types uh, will will bring opportunities and constraints to what the project could look like in the end. And then lastly, reach four from the Carpinteria Creek mouth to Tar Pits Park is characterized by a bluff backed shoreline uh, and a relatively narrow beach. We can go to the next line. First, when we're talking about shoreline management and a living shoreline, what are we talking about? These, these opportunities that the city has for shoreline protection, uh, habitat enhancement, enhanced public access. Uh, I'm going to go through four uh, project potential project components. The first is beach nourishment, and beach nourishment is a key component to any shoreline management plan in the city that is going to uh, widen the I, with the intention of widening the beach and uh, helping to buffer the city from storm waves and sea level rise. Beach nourishment will be defined by its sediment sources of which there are uh, a varied amount of sources, but uh, of different types of sediment, uh, different distances away from the city. There's debris basins. There are um, deposits of sand in the Carpinteria Inlet or Santa, Bar uh, Santa Barbara Harbor, Harbor. Sorry. And then there's also sediment placement uh, techniques. How do we deliver the sand to the coastline? Where do we place the sand? As historically, there has been uh, trucking through Ash Avenue and placement at the edge of Ash Avenue, um, but there are other opportunities for pipeline uh, dredging materials by pipeline to the beach or trucking to uh, different portions of different sites. The next opportunity is cobble nourishment. Cobble nourishment is a relatively uh, new idea in soft engineering practices, 
It's been implemented in a couple locations. Uh, you may be aware of Surfers Point in Ventura, not too far down the coast. And cobble nourishment has its benefits in that cobble material is heavier and it holds its place a little bit better than sand. When storm waves come to push uh, beach materials around, sandy material gets picked up and put offshore as, as sandbars, but cobble material can actually uh, move landward and it can build an elevation and become more resilient in the face of storms. So cobble has a, this uh, unique reaction to storm waves that makes it a good, possibly a good material for living shoreline construction. There are some downsides to cobble though. It, it can be difficult to walk on. It can be um, pushed around by waves and become um, hazardous. And sources of cobble can be difficult to find. There are some quarries which have river cobble. Um, there's some natural beach sand deposit, beach deposits, like currently in Carpinteria, cobble, cobble is being exposed. Uh, but it, it's, it's a relatively new practice, so we're exploring the opportunities there. Next, please. A third key component is dune habitat restoration. And this may look different across the uh, different reaches. For instance, the city beach area does not have any anything for vegetated dune habitat at the moment. If a living shoreline were constructed there, uh, vegetation could be planted, native plants would be uh, planted to take root, provide habitat, capture windblown sand, and increase the stability of the vegetated dune. Whereas along California state parks, there is dune habitat at the moment, so uh, the city and state parks could possibly work together to enhance those dunes if there is an opportunity for that. Next, please. And the last item I wanted to touch on is sand retention strategies. <clears throat> sand retention is a uh, potentially um, beneficial uh, approach to maintaining the Carpinteria shoreline. For instance, this picture on the right here is of a groin in Ventura. And you can see to the left hand side of the picture that sand has built up and that beach is wider on the left hand side. Yep. That's because sediment is transporting from up coast and it's uh, reaching that terminal uh, end at the groin and it's uh, okay. that barrier is capturing sediment. I'll trade you. Groins can ha sometimes have a negative effect where down coast of the groin, um, there's a relatively more narrow beach or potential sediment losses. So groin design has to take into account its width, its length, its crest height to try to manage the pros and cons of maintaining a beach up coast and uh, not being detrimental to a beach down coast. Other sediment retention strategies to be considered are a nearshore reef perhaps or uh, a breakwater. But a groin um, may be most apt in, in Carpinteria. <clears throat> What does a living shoreline look like on the ground when it's constructed? Here's a few projects which have occurred on the West Coast, two in Southern California. On the left-hand side is the Cardiff Beach Living Shoreline constructed in Encinitas of San Diego County in 2018. This stretch of coastline is a sandy beach. There was scattered riprap and Highway 101 along the backside. And the rocks were assembled, buried by sand and cobble, and then planted. Beach access ways were, were cut through from the roadside to the beach side. And since then, the, the dune has really thrived. It's, it's grown in size a little from capturing sediment by, ve by uh, the vegetation and sand fencing. Beach access has been maintained, and um, so far it's provided protection to Highway 101. The same goes for Surfers Point Living Shoreline, which was constructed in Ventura in 2011 and has so far persisted through uh, such storms as the 2015-2016 El Nino season. The Surfers Point Living Shoreline is interesting because that contains instead of a buried revetment like at Cardiff Beach, it contains a buried cobble berm and um, is, a, is a key project that we're looking to for sort of developing design criteria of what uh, how you could use cobble in vegetated sand dune design. And lastly, Cape Lookout in Oregon is uh, one of the earlier West Coast examples of a living shoreline construction. And this was developed by scientists in Oregon and is another project that we are uh, referencing and, and, and learning from. Next slide, please.
So I'll go through site constraints and then I'll follow that with site uh, with the feasibility of implementation and then I'll hand it back to Marie. There are several constraints and they come from really all, all sorts of places um, and I'll, I'll really touch on some of the key ones here, but uh, there are others and we're open to hearing from you what you think might be important to consider in design. Uh, one is topography. As I said, Reach 1 has a very narrow beach and it's backed by a revetment, and that makes it difficult to uh, consider designing a living shoreline. Uh, vegetated sand dunes need probably at least a 50 foot sand uh, beach buffer maintained at all times to protect it from blowing out in a storm. But Reach 2, for instance, it, at uh, the city beach area is a, a wider sandy beach. We could possibly see that 50 foot beach berm protective buffer. Um, however, it's backed by development and there's some low elevation points by Ash Avenue that need to be considered uh, if considering a living shoreline here. Then along Reach 3 at, uh, at the terminal, there is Carpentry at Creek and sediment management needs to consider that creek mouth. We don't want to, un, um, to mistakenly cause increased closures and we want to maintain that natural mouth as it is because it has sensitive habitat, which I'll touch on later. And then lastly, Tar Pits Park, that bluff-backed shoreline is, uh, bluff-backed bluff beaches are rarely uh, an area for vegetated sand dunes. So a different type of shoreline management technique in that area uh, may be preferred. Next slide, please. Biological resources are, are also a constraint. Carpinteria Reef, over at the inlet mouth of Carpinteria Marsh is one area to be uh, wary of. Beach nourishment projects may be uh, designed a little bit further away from that, that reef to avoid sedimentation. Um, another area is the existing state park dunes. As I said, there's already dune habitat uh, within the city. And so that could possibly be enhanced or it, it's at least, uh, it's very great place to learn from. Carpinteria Creek, there is the fish passage for steelhead trout that need to be protected. And then there's rocky intertidal habitat just offshore of Carpinteria, um, which is sensitive to sedimentation. So beach nourishment design um, volumes or construction timing, monitoring programs, all of these will have to uh, take into account this sensitive habitat. Next slide, please. Another site constraint is uh, specific to the beach neighborhood. The oceanfront parcels, actually the parcel boundary extends into the sandy area. This is called the private beach in, in certain documents. And I think it's about 30 feet wide, but it, well, I, sh I shouldn't say that. I don't know the exact number and it may vary from parcel to parcel. Um, but there is a portion of the beach which is private and the winter berm program currently aims to construct the winter berm just on the boundary of that private beach. So any concept of a living shoreline needs to be wary of this private boundary and uh, we, we will need to be working with the homeowners to uh, come to a agreed upon solution. Next slide, please. Public access ways and view shed are another key component that these are very um, valued assets in Carpinteria at the moment. And the project is, uh, you know, we need to be cautious and, uh, and minimize any impacts to these as best as possible. There are public access ways at street ends uh, currently and public access ways can be designed through a living shoreline. View shed can be, uh, is, is something to consider strongly. If I'm standing behind the dune on the landward side, am I uh, needing to see over the dune to the ocean? Um, what is it like from the residence's viewpoint? Um, how do we balance the protective value of a living shoreline? How, mu how much it can withstand a storm with how, uh, how much it may impact public access and view shed. These are things we are considering at the moment and looking for your opinion on. Next slide, please. Construction will be another constraint, um, though it's anticipated to be to be feasible. Material delivery, uh, historically through Ash Avenue, um, has has been a burden on some residents, and so there is a we are considering other methods that we could find to bring sediment to the beach. Um, 
maybe there's Linden Avenue uh, placement, Ash Avenue placement, um, dredge pipeline placement. Um, Land-based equipment will likely be used for construction of the living shoreline. These are like bulldozers, excavators, and so forth. And these can create a lot of noise and they need staging areas. So the preferred timing of a construction project is Labor Day to Memorial Day to avoid the highest public use times during the summer. Next slide, please. In summary, some of the most key constraints that we'll need to work with the public on are that that footprint of ownership uh, of ownership parcels and balancing the project footprint with um, parcels owned by by the public, um, maintaining public access, min minimizing viewshed impacts, and also uh, minimizing the construction uh, disruption. These are our key uh, constraints at the moment. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The project is it's really considered feasible to implement, um, although we're not at any we, we haven't designed the project yet, but there's been su successful implementation in Surface Point at Cardiff Beach and elsewhere. Uh, permitting wise, federal permits will have to be acquired. The dune project being above the mean high tide line um, might be more more simple than a beach nourishment project, which uh, becomes part of state lands. Uh, encroaches on state lands areas or Army Corps districts. So these projects will, um, the project will be permitted differently depending on, on how the final design ends up looking. Other permits we'll be looking to get are California Coastal Commission CDPs, working with the Regional Water Quality Control Board and state lands commissions. We'll have to coordinate with state parks as well because ideally this project will look, uh, and we are looking at it holistically, and a, uh, an actual implemented project will ideally be able to respond to those regional sea level rise vulnerabilities. You know, sea level rise does not act locally. It doesn't act specific to um, the beach neighborhood, for instance. You know, a, a storm will uh, hit the Carpentry shoreline all at once from the from sandy land all the way down to the state parks. So a project should be ideally designed to uh, to help protect against that wider regional vulnerability. Next slide, please. Other considerations for implementation will be the monitoring and maintenance of the project. Monitoring is going to be is going to be key because this is still a relatively new um, um, engineering technique. You know, living shorelines are are constructed in a few places and they've been shown to be success, successful but they uh, require monitoring to, to help uh, guarantee that success and identify areas where we can improve. Biological monitoring of the vegetation can help identify non-native species and enhance that dune growth and habitat. Physical monitoring can help identify uh, if your dune has been washed out in one area or another. Are, you maintain, are we maintaining a beach berm that uh, is wide enough to provide a buffer for the winter time? And nearshore monitoring, especially during a beach nourishment project, may be important to uh, ensure that biological resources are not being uh, impacted severely. Dovetailing with monitoring is uh, if, if we're monitoring the project um, and we find problems, then we'll have to that the city will need to maintain maintain those problems. And especially with the soft engineering materials, sand, cobble, these are not um, they don't don't hold their place permanently like a revetment does. You know they they move with the waves. They move with the the, the environment, and so sand, although it will find its uh, aim to find its equilibrium with the ocean, it can be blown into the streets and and cause sand sweeping uh, issues and, and maintenance um, needs. And if a uh, big storm were to overwash an area of a dune, then there might be a loss of sand in that area, and import sand might need to be imported. And vegetation, as I said, might become invasive and, and need to be maintained. So uh, the Living Shoreline project is a um, project that needs to be to be, to be watched and, and potentially maintained. So uh, creating a, a plan for that maintenance early is important. Next slide, please. Lastly, I'll, I'll touch on um, that the project is also likely feasible because of uh, the availability of, of funding. 
Uh, Living Shoreline projects are uh, listed under grant applications, under the qualifications for grant applications uh, frequently these days. In fact, one just came out just this week from the Ocean Protection Council. Um, a, a project like this may be eligible. So <clears throat> soft engineering methods, living shorelines, and protecting habitat, protecting development, protecting beach access. If a project can do all three of those uh, um, goals, then then it will be very competitive in the in the grant application world. And the State Coastal Conservancy, Department of Boating and Water Ways, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, NOAA, all of these have grants which have come out in the past and some planned in the future, which may fit this project. All right, I think it's back to Marie now. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. Thanks, Connor. Let's see. OK. So we are amidst the constraints and feasibility analysis and would love to hear your input on that. Um, looking further out, uh, once we nail down uh, what exactly we're dealing with in the constraints and feasibility analysis, we are going to develop a narrow down list of design alternatives for the living shoreline, which then will carry forward through to the modeling phase. And we'll see how each of those design alternatives holds up against different sea level rise and coastal hazards scenarios. After which case we'll determine which design is the most ideal to implement for the Carpinteria city beach frontage. And then our comprehensive analysis of each of the stages that we went through that are listed here will be integrated into the dune and shoreline management plan which as a reminder will be two-pronged the first part is that it will be specifically to design a living shoreline for the city beach frontage and then the second part is to look at a comprehensive cohesive approach to regional shoreline management planning and throughout this entire process, we'll continue to coordinate with agencies and stakeholders and host public outreach events like this one. So with that, um, I will hand it off to Erin and um, open it up to questions. Thanks, Marie. I see we have a few questions in our chat box, so I'm gonna go through those. And then if anybody else has a question, just um, once we go through these, just go ahead and either use the raise hand feature or feel free to just speak up. Um, so Andrew Brooks had a question about um, beach access points, uh, said don't the beach access points in the Cardiff beach allow flooding of the roadway and it seems like flood tides would flow through to access the access points on this one and then become trapped in the roadway side of the beach berm as the tide goes out again. Uh, that's something that we actually have discussed. Uh, we even discussed it today. Um, one thing that we need to take into account with any management strategy is that we have two sources of coastal flooding, uh, not just coming directly from the ocean, but also from the Carpentria salt marsh. Um, so that's something that we are taking into account as we move through this process that, you know, there's going to be other projects that we're going to need to address further along uh, to make sure that we don't have water trapped in the roadway. Um, and then we have another question. Um, given current rates of sea level rise projections and current limitations to allow managed retreat of the living shoreline, what is the projected lifespan of this habitat, 50 years? Um, I'm gonna let Connor, you wanna answer that question? Sure, thanks Aaron. And thanks for the question, Andrew. Uh, we don't have an answer directly to design life at the moment because we haven't, uh, we are planning to come up with concepts shortly and uh, model those concepts. And during our modeling, we'll be able to determine do we think this can withstand a 50 year storm? Can we can it withstand a 100 year storm? Can it withstand two feet of sea level rise, four feet of sea level rise? What what sort of conditions will this project still um, uh, provide protection under? Now, I don't think it is 
expected that the project will be a long-term sea level rise resilience. It is more of a midterm um, adaptation project. Uh, not That doesn't give you a, a specific span of years, but it is a midterm project. Thanks, Connor. Um, the next question, my experience is that the cobbles often make the beach unusable. Would you try to cover it with sand? Or um, yes, the, the plan is uh, to use a cobble base and cover it with sand. Uh, so what would happen is that during winter months, typically cobble is exposed and then summer months it would be covered again with sand. Connor, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, thanks. You, you nailed it, Aaron. I, I think it, ideally cobble would be buried and only exposed in uh, as a sort of a last line of defense. You know, if if there were street, severe erosive conditions, then the beach would be washed out um, in any condition. Hopefully that cobble can can linger around and provide protection. Thanks. And then the next question, a groin was mentioned as a possible hard option. Will you be considering an artificial headland as another hard alternative? And I'll hand this off to Connor again. I will say that we're not that far into this process, so we haven't made those determinations yet, but Connor, you can, you can speak here. Sure, thanks. Um, I think by, by an artificial headland is that you may be hinting at a, a cobble headland, a cobble groin. There's, I think, one in the works at Goleta Beach, and that is something to be considered, uh, absolutely. Um, it may be a little less uh, less long term of a solution than a, than a rock groin, but it may be suitable for helping to build a beach that builds a buffer that allows vegetation to take hold. So we will be looking at that. Thank you. All right, and I'll open this up to any other questions that folks have. I see. Hold on, John. Go ahead, John Lawson. Uh, good evening, John? everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Alasson, the Polar Works Director for the City of Carpinteria. This is actually my first uh, attendance of the public workshop, and thank you. Uh, I like to thank uh, our consultant and Aaron for putting this together. I do. I haven't. I didn't uh, hear a mention of it, but I wanted to mention to the general public that. The effort that's uh, being done uh, is paid for in part by a grant fund called the Caltrans Sustainable Transportation Planning and Adaptation Planning Grant. Uh, so that amount, I believe, Aaron, is in the tune of $237,000 that goes to the Dune and Shoreline Management Plan effort. Yes, correct. Okay, so I just wanted to mention that there are state aid money involved in developing a Boone and Shoreline Manager Plan. Thank you. Yeah, and to jump off of that, we plan on continuing to seek out grant funding as we move through this process. Like um, Connor mentioned, there are a lot of grants out there that um, we can take advantage of. Uh, we're not at the point yet where we're able to apply for next phase funding just because um, we're not at, at the stage of the project where we have something, a project to propose to apply for funding. But as that funding becomes available, we will be applying for it. Uh, I also wanted to touch on something that Connor had said about monitoring. Um, there's multiple different kinds of monitoring, but something that um, we've been discussing among South Coast agencies is ways that we can partner on monitoring. Uh, I often, if you've been to any of my presentations before, you, you would know that I often um, really promote interagency partnerships as a great way to get things accomplished, uh, especially with um, limited budgeting and as a way of having uniform data. Uh, so that's an effort that we have discussed among the South Coast agencies, uh, a way to have a sort of long-term monitoring strategy of all of our beaches, Goleta Beach, Santa Barbara, Carpinteria, the county beaches in between. 
uh, as we do projects, we have specific monitoring requirements that come up, but the monitoring requirements themselves are very similar. So having that uniform data set could be very beneficial for us long term. Um, any other questions? I don't see any hands raised. Well, uh, we're keeping it short and sweet tonight, not taking up too much of your time. Oh, uh, Andrew, go ahead. Andrew Brooks. Hi, Aaron. I, I put this in the in the chat. Thanks for the for the invitation to join the the webinar. This is really informative. I I just wanted to point out two things. One, the construction of any hard structure like a groin to the east of the opening of the Carpentaria salt marsh would have to really look hard at the potential to cause more frequent closures of the mouth by um, the more frequent formation of a sandbar across the mouth. Right now, that happens, you know, every seven to eight years or so, and it has pretty, pretty significant negative impacts on the marsh and the marsh's biota. Um, so if that were to happen more frequently because sand was piling up behind a groin, for instance, and sort of backfilling up the coast, um, that could cause a, a pretty big problem. Um, I'm not saying it, it couldn't be solved. It's just something that really needs to be looked at very closely. Um, the second thing is, in, in terms of your comments about monitoring, I'm sure that there could be some sort of uh, partnership to do some of that with the university and through the Carpentaria Salt Marsh Reserve. Um, we already do some monitoring, and we could probably discuss ways to to increase that or partner with that. So just something to make a note of, and we can talk about it in the future. Great. Thanks for your feedback. That's excellent to know. Um, and that's a good point you bring up about the salt marsh. Uh, you know, one of the areas that we were talking about possibly doing something is down towards the other side of the Carpentaria Creek mouth. So it'd be pretty far down coast. Um, and we're also thinking about sources for sand. Do you know these, all of this material needs to come from somewhere. So where does that come from? And how do we do that in a way that isn't too disruptive for the local community or the local environment? You know, uh, these are all things that we have to take into consideration as we move through this process. Um, so, and, and again, oh, I should really stress what Connor said. This is not a long-term solution. You know, this is a near, a near to midterm solution. So what we're hoping is that um, as we move through this process, we will be also thinking of more long-term ideas to address sea level rise. And that could be a lot of different things. Um, and we don't really know what that looks like at this time. Um, I also wanted to mention, um, we, if you look at the carpentry berm that is out there today, um, you know, we have our winter berm program and we do have a sand berm out there right now. Uh, you know, what the profile of whatever we are considering would be lower than what the profile of what is out there today is. Um, you know, we want this to be something that benefits the community and uh, the local residents and everyone who lives on the beach. All right, anything else? It looks like people are adding comments in the chat, Erin. Oh, perfect. Hold on, let me pull up the chat. Um, would recommend focusing on maintaining and enhancing natural sand supply, including full annual dredging at Santa Barbara Harbor and transport all suitable sediment from nearby debris basins to Carpentry Beach. Uh, that is one thing that we have definitely discussed. Um, I we think that those are great sources of sediment. Um, the biggest thing that we have to consider is delivery method. Um, you know, our only delivery method, our only points of entry to the beach right now are within a residential neighborhood. So it would be coming up with a program that doesn't disrupt those neighborhoods unnecessarily for long periods of time. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with how things were during emergency debris disposal at the beach. Um, 
we do we do want to mitigate those disposals, but we do think that there are ways that we can deliver sediment from those sources without disrupting the local community to that degree. And then worth noting that Carpentry Creek was one of the few drainages with significant sediment input during the heavy rains that produced Montecito mud flows. Uh, yeah, USGS has a, surveyed the mound and is monitoring its evolution with the annual fall bathymetry surveys. Yep, we are aware of that. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Daniel. Um, and then, oh, this is something that we have talked about. Uh, there is a large volume of accumulated beach sand in the Carpentry Marsh. Some was removed by county flood control after the debris flow, but more could be removed to restore deep water habitat near the mouth. This could not be an every year supply, though more like a one-time source. Uh, Chris, are you on? We had discussed this at one point that there was a mitigation plan out there for moving that sediment to another source. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, the, the university has had a plan for a long time to remove a lot of that accumulated material. And um, some of it was actually removed by county flood control when they cleaned up the two creeks all the way out to the mouth of the marsh following the 2018 debris flow. So there's not as much there now as there was. Um, but we would really like to recreate some of the deep water habitat near the marsh. And we had a plan and permits on the book to use hy a hydraulic dredge, much like the one that county flood control used, um, to pump that sand out just past the surf line and let it re-nourish the, the beach and carp. And actually it was something we were gonna sort of contribute to beach re-nourishment. Uh, and so we, we could do that, but obviously there's an impact to removing that material on everything that lives in that sand. And so right. it's not something that we could do year after year after year after year. It would, it would have to be a one-time contribution or maybe once every 25 years kind of thing. Um, Otherwise, we'd be doing more harm than good. Yeah, no, I'm aware of that. And I believe there's some funding that had been allocated, not by the university, but by another source. Um, I'll have to look more into that and get back to you. Yeah, that. you might check with Matt Roberts. Matt was yeah. you know, talking with the folks at Beacon. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll discuss it and I'll get back to you on that. Um, Andrea, I see that you have your hand up. After that last uh, dredging, it took a long time just for the crabs to start coming back, and they still aren't back in the uh, at the rate that they were previously. It it really did a lot of damage to the animals. And speaking of monitoring, is it going to be like a five-year plan like they usually have with restoration projects, or what sort of thing is it? I mean, I'm. Uh for this, it would be long-term monitoring. I mean, we expect that there would probably be some invasives, um, but monitoring would, would be through the life of the project. You know, we would need to evaluate on an annual basis how that, how well it's doing and what would need to be done. Would you be hiring people to keep it clean? Um, well, you know, it, it's not just weed management that we need to, you know, it's, it's a lot of different things. So, it, you know, it could be that we would need more sediment sources. It could be weed management. Like that, those are things that will come out of whatever design, you know, that that'll be further along in the process, what, how we determine that. Um, Something for you to think about, though. Yeah, there will be a monitoring plan that's a part of this of how we manage it long term. It is a dune and shoreline management plan. So, yeah, that will be incorporated into it. Any other questions? Well, seeing none, I'll wrap things up. Uh, if you are not on our contact list and would like to be, just send me an email. Um, Marie, can you put up the slide that had my contact information on it again? Yes, sure thing. Just one minute. And as I mentioned, this is being recorded, so we will have um, the posted probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, so you can go back and rewatch it. The previous workshop 
was recorded as well and is already up there. So if you were not able to attend that and you're interested in seeing what it was, that workshop, please feel free to do that. Um, we will be holding additional public workshops as we get, as, as we move through this process. Uh, we're trying not to duplicate the workshops, so it's always new information. Um, so find all of this stuff under our Dune and Shoreline Management Plan, which is under Public Works Engineering Division on the Kirp and Rio website. Um, if you just go to our website and type in Dune and Shoreline, you can it'll take you to that page. Uh, my email address is up here. Feel free to with any additional questions. Uh, we'd be happy to answer questions if they come up in the future. I do see one additional comment that we may also want to support replacing the debris basin dam at Santa Monica Basin with a smart dam. Uh, I'm guessing that you are uh, to something like um, what they did at Gubernador Canyon, where they have a dam and that allows for flow through of a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, that would be great. I don't know what the likelihood of flood control doing that is, but I, I agree that those are much more, much better for the downstream environment. Um, all right. Well, with that, I'm going to wrap things up. And again, feel free to contact me with any additional questions and, or comments. And thank you all for making time to attend tonight's workshop.